Good evening to all of you fiends and ghouls. A very special haunted Halloween to all of you. Tonight I share three ghoulish tales. The very first one is called The Man from August Ridge. The man from August Ridge lives across the O'Neill Bridge. He only comes out at night to kill one by dawn's early light. They say he wields a mighty axe and stands six foot four, or so goes the lore. Never seek out his house. Deep in the O'Neill forest of oaks and pines, he likes to hunt you from above the trees and as quiet as a church mouse. He will have you in one of his metal traps before your crooked jaws flap. Your screams are in his favorite daydreams. He treasures each and every one because when your blood is spilled, that is when his fun has truly begun. He's always been rather odd, cut you up and eat you alive. While he has you sing to him, he never misses dinner and a show. He collects your favorite songs and adds them to his playlist. He listens to them after. So if you find yourself lost and fate had not been so very kind, to meet the man from August Ridge best you can do is hope death comes fast as a meteorite while he devours you in every last bite. I stood in the hallway after my last period looking at the poster of Phoebe Grant. She'd been missing for over a week and most of us figured she'd run away. Most of the stoner kids I knew were like that. They were the school drifters in and out a lot, and a lot of them had names, but no one remembered them. Phoebe Grant was a name we now remembered because of all the posters decorated the school hallways and the lockers. There was even a vigil held a week ago for her. Kyle came up behind me, knocking the wind out of me. Hey! We still go into the O'Neill Bridge tonight and look for some local legends, like the men from August Ridge. Yeah, I'm game if you are. Awesome. I'll bring the camera so we can take some footage for the senior class YouTube video. Casey Coleman came over and kissed Kyle on the cheek. Hey, babe. She gleefully chimed in my ears like a bullet. I rolled my eyes. Kyle was the living embodiment of a guy who had everything, including the prettiest girl in school my crush, Casey, among other things. I wouldn't have done anything to be Kyle for a day back then. So are we going to scope out the O'Neill Woods tonight? I let Matt and Mackenzie know. I am so excited, she squealed, and I looked questioningly at Kyle, who smiled shruggingly. I had thought it was just going to be a quick video trip so I could finish our version of the senior class movie to play at graduation. Instead, it was double date night and me, as usual, the fifth wheel. Sure, I nodded. My other best friend, Alex, was also girl Fredless. The only difference was he wasn't into girls. We didn't go straight to the O'Neill Woods, though, that night. To kill time, we stopped at the local bar in town, called the Grotto with our fake IDs, and got in to see some kind of band. Alex was by the stage when the band started playing. The lead singer was one of those guys that tried too hard to be Chris Cornell, but failed at it miserably. Not to mention, there was only one. There were a few other local bands I wanted to see kill time, but that all stopped abruptly. <laughs> Your band sucks, Alex yelled who had already had a few beers before he left his house. Alex, man, stop, I said, patting his shoulder. Instead of listening to me, he only laughed. I know music, and this dude sucks. The band abruptly stopped playing. Look here, you little shit. 
If you don't like it, get the hell out. A few people from the audience cheered. Alex looked back at the crowd. I could do a better job of your song than you. Go back to the costume store where we got that shitty outfit and find some better suited, I don't know, like a clown costume. Kyle saw the common and then joined me, trying to get Alex to shut up. What is your deal, man? This guy's a poser. I fucking hate posers. Well, maybe you should learn to control your friend, buddy, the lead singer yelled. Shut up, man. We got it, Kyle yelled. Alex shot up his middle finger and the guy lunged towards Alex, tripping over the microphone cord and hitting his chin on the corner of the stage, head first. Alex, being the typical dick he was, clapped. Best performance you did all night. The audience began to clap too, all laughing at the incident. Some had out their phones making videos of it. We dragged Alex out of the building, but not before the now furious lead singer yelled back at Alex. You guys messed with the wrong son of a bitch. We left before we could see any of the other bands we had actually come to. We piled into two cars shortly after midnight and drove down past the park and through a long, half-paved road towards the old run-down barn in the center of O'Neill Woods. The only light came from our two vehicles, and we kept on driving deeper into the O'Neill farmstead. Finally, we went to the run-down shack in the old red barn. It was amazingly intact for something so old. I got out of my car first, and then walked towards Casey and Kyle, who were kissing in the front seat of the vehicle while Pearl Jam's cover of Last Kiss played in the background. I wrinkled my nose at them. Did either one of them even know what the song was about? Hey, you two lovebirds, want to get out and start this thing? I'm trying to sound light, but I was getting annoyed. Behind me was Alex, standing with Mackenzie and Matt. Yeah, let's go see some haunted barn action. <laughs> I, was think I was thinking of uh, doing some photography for my portfolio, Alex said, walking around looking at the property. Ugh, gross. There's probably ticks out here, Mackenzie said, caressing her long blonde ponytail. Did you guys remember to bring any off? Casey got out of the car, shaking her head at Mackenzie. No, but I've got some body spray. She handed her something in a bottle. That's okay. If I ever want to learn to be a model on the cover of Vogue, I have to be comfortable in the outdoor locations, right? <laughs> Casey giggled. We all began to follow Alex towards the barn, looking around. Kyle began to film on his digital camera, and then we halted. There was a light coming from one of the shacks near the barn. We all stopped talking and just looked at one another. What is it? What's going on? Mackenzie asked. A light, obviously, Alex said, walking towards it. Anyone want to follow me, or you all want to stay there? Casey walked on and nearly fell over. She had stumbled upon something in the grass. Picking up the object, it was cassette tape. Music to kill people, too. Ew, creepy, Mackenzie said, shivering. I wasn't so convinced, grabbing the cassette. People like to come out here and do weird stuff because of the legend of the man from August Ridge. Come on, you idiots, Alex was yelling. We followed him towards the shack. I expected to see someone camping out there for the night, but when we got closer, something did not feel right. There was a smell I couldn't place, but it made me nauseous. Then I nearly got sick. Alex covered his mouth and then opened the old door to the shack. Mackenzie came up behind him, and then she let out a scream. The song Doll Parts by Hole was playing on an old CD player. There was white and pastel pink candles lit all around the small room. They had been lit for a long while because they were melting all around. There were photos of toys and dolls on the walls of the shack, and rotten cupcakes with flies still on them. There were hooks and giant clothespins on the table, and coagulated blood on the walls. Pieces of heavy-duty thread lay around the floor, but in the center was the most terrifying thing of all. Something I will never get out of my mind. The smell was from the rotting flesh in the center of the room. A body was rotting inside it. There was no mistaking the scent or the now blue and bloated pieces of flesh that seemed to hang from purposely placed wires. 
The arms and legs were not connected to the torso in front of us. Instead, they had been cut off and sewn back together with a large black utility thread. They hung from wires over the body, which hung in the middle of the room. The legs also had been severed and sewn into place and hung in a sitting position while the torso and the arms floated above it separately. The body had on ruffled underwear and a pink teddy. I could tell that the form in front of me was no wax artistic rendering for shock. It was a real body. However, I could not place who it was because the face had been covered with a mask that looked like a doll baby. I had tears in my eyes and had drowned out the screams from the others who were trying to get me out of there as fast as I, they could. My hand wavered over the unseen face and lifted the mask. Then it let out a heavy breath, and I knew the person who severed limbs hanging in front of me. She was alive. I gulped. It was none other than Phoebe Grant. The girl had been missing for over a week, whose torso was now in front of us. Please... Help me. She barely was aware that she was alive or that we were there. I was unsure how, in my panic, and if I moved her torso, would she fall victim to more injury? Holy shit, we need to get her out of here. Alex was frantically screaming in a cracked voice. The sound of the screams from my friends now carried weight with me, and I knew I had to get out of there. I also couldn't let this poor creature in front of me die. Then I saw a shadow. It loomed from behind Phoebe, and suddenly she gargled blood, and her, fed, her head fell, fell backward. A man rose from behind her. How he got there, I had no idea. He must have been waiting there. He was there now, holding a large instrument that I could not see. I only saw it poke through her neck in front of me. I now knew Phoebe was dead and I wasted no more time trying to figure out who her assailant was. We ran towards our car, and though we were in the high school sprint team, soon Kyle was speeding out of the road, and I struggled to find my grip on the steering wheel. I didn't see the man again. He seemed to have all but disappeared. I sped out of the muddy road following Kyle, all the while trying to grasp what had just happened. It seemed as though fate had other ideas. Kyle swerved to the right, and before I could comprehend one horror, I was witnessing another. Kyle and Casey's car went over the road and down into the valley. I stopped the vehicle abruptly, and the other four of us got out of the car running towards the car. Casey was okay. She was just passed out. Kyle's head was in between the glass that had shattered the truck's windshield. Glass lay around the seat, and Alex was already screaming for the 911 operator to get there. I looked up at the road, and there was a little street light, and a man stood, watching us. I could not see his face from the shadows. I watched him standing silently, watching us. He remained motionless, as though there were, he were studying our every move, our every frame, and our voices. I looked away for a moment as an ambulance and three cop cars came speeding up the road. When I looked back, he was gone. We gather here today to say our goodbyes to one of our town's favorite football players. Mikhail Thomas was more than that. He was my best friend. When I moved here from San Francisco three years ago, I didn't have anyone. I had a bad attitude, no friends, and just the thought of how much I hated Ohio. Kyle was the first friend I ever made. He was popular, smart, and had loads of girls that liked him. Kyle was also a guy with a big heart. He reached out to me after my first day at school to see if I was okay. We ended up being good friends. We had a lot in common for a guy who was captain of the football team, and me a guy whose favorite band was The Cure. <laughs> For that, I'll never forget him. When that car went off the bridge, our entire lives changed forever. I just feel lucky that we were part of each other's lives, even if it was for a short time. 
I wiped tears from my eyes and forgot the fact that people were staring at me. I sat down in my seat and a hand tapped me on the shoulder. It was Casey Coleman, the girl that I had liked since I first moved to Medina. She was also Kyle's girlfriend. I smiled and tried not to think about the fact my competition was gone. I didn't feel right thinking to my feelings. Even as Kyle's coffin lay a few feet in front of me, it just didn't seem right that I should feel the way I did about her. Great speech, Jude. She smiled at me, giving me an empathetic smile I had grown used to in the last few weeks since Kyle's death. She still had a bandage over her eyebrow from the accident and was sporting a pink cast around her arm. The crowd at the funeral stared at us. I knew they suspected us over Phoebe Grant's death. I think they thought we were some sort of man from August Ridge cult and that we had hurt Phoebe. It made me sick to think of anyone doing that to anyone even someone I considered a stranger. I half grinned at her as she approached the pulpit to speak. The wind blew her red hair and it caught the sun as she read her thoughts to us about Kyle Thomas. When the funeral was over, I walked by myself to Kyle's parents' house, where everyone was meeting for refreshments. I didn't want to go, but in the back of my mind, I knew I would look suspicious if, you know, none of us went. There were six of us emphasizing the past tense with Kyle that went just five, just me, Casey, Mackenzie, Alex, and Matt. When I got to Kyle's house, the other five were already there. Alex vaping some kind of cappuccino-flavored vape pen. It smelled awful and in a way comforting. I needed normal now more than ever. Hey, he said, standing up and tossing his long hair out of his eyes. Where is everyone? Eh, inside. He nodded towards the door. You know, with all their accusatory eyeballs. You ready for this? I asked him, thinking of how things had been in the last few weeks, since the last week or so since Kyle had died. No, but after today, maybe we can try and get our lives back to normal, he said, annoyed. I knew he was right. I went inside and saw Mackenzie standing with Casey, holding her hand as tears streamed down Casey's face. Brian was eating wings as though he had no care in the world, and Matt was talking to Kyle's mom when I went in. I saw each of them look in my direction as though they knew something that I didn't. I took a deep breath and walked towards Kyle's mom. I got a hug from her and a lecture about how there was so much food and she was counting on us kids to eat all of it. I could tell she was trying to be okay, as okay as you could be with your only child dead. I made my rounds pretending to be interested in the food and the drinks, but I was too sick to eat, and I stole a bottle of whiskey from the liquor cabinet and went outside to the backyard. I hid by one of the large oak trees and tried to get a hold of myself. Then Alex and Matt came outside. Matt had on his letterman jacket over his nice shirt and his tie. Well, now what? You think he'll come looking for us after what we saw? Matt asked. Why am I suddenly an expert? I was suddenly resenting my friends, who were eyeing me suspiciously. You know what we saw up on August Ridge. You know who, I should say, Matt said, turning a shade wider than the thought. I wasn't the man from August Ridge. It just wasn't him. Some stupid psycho, some sicko, copying the legend. You don't know that, said Alex, grabbing the bottle of whiskey from my hand and taking a swig, coughing as if it was some, as if it was supposed to go down right. Well, so far, everything is okay, I said, sarcastically grabbing back the bottle. You better be. What's the point of any of this? Why did this have to happen? Matt asked. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, I said suddenly, wanting to be as far away from everyone as humanly possible. I stood up, bored with the pretending to grieve, when I wanted to find the killer that had murdered my friend. Where are you going? Alex asked me, his silvery blue eyes pierced through me. Home, I said, leaving.
I walked back through the house and stopped. Standing in front of me was the lead singer of that band Alex booed off the stage. What the hell was he doing here? Then I saw him turn. He turned and looked at me. He was smiling, as if to nod empathetically. He was with an older man and they were both talking to Kyle's mom. I nudged past them all and left, leaving the screen door flapping in the wind behind me. I walked in the direction of my house and thought of my mother. She'd been gone when I got home. She worked long hours at the printing factory in town. We had moved back to her home in Medina, Ohio after my dad and she divorced. I walked through the town square, past the Ritzman Pharmacy and tried to take my mind off everything. It was quiet, almost too soft and too quiet. I couldn't even hear a wind blow a chime. There was always something about a town full of people inside their houses. And you were a lone wolf on the street or the sidewalk, even in broad daylight. It sent shivers down my spine in a weird way. When I finally got home, mail was sticking out of the mailbox. I grabbed it, but it wouldn't budge. Something was blocking it from moving out of the small mailbox. When I finally got it out, there was a box inside with my name on it. No postage marking, just my first and last name. That was weird. I opened it up, feeling a sickening feeling in my stomach as I held the item from the box. It was like something you'd see in a movie. Strange packages arriving. <laughs> that was never a good thing. I pulled it out, realizing it was a CD with a crude writing that said, Six. I didn't know what the number meant, but I opened the CD and loaded it into my computer. It was a video of some lyric from the song Polly by Nirvana. On the screen were some lyrics blinking across the screen. Cut yourself. Want some help? Cut yourself. Want some help? And over again it repeated. At the end of the video was an image of someone slicing their own wrists. The person you couldn't see was cutting them repeatedly in a repetitive motion while a shadow loomed in the background. I thought it was weird. and I wasn't sure if it was related to anything. The sickening part was that my stomach told me that it had everything to do with what we saw in those woods. I knew my Nirvana tracks pretty well and realized that this was a six trap off of Nevermind. Was the six on the CD for the six track? Until now, I had never given music much thought. It was just something you listen to to feel better. Music was an emotional thing to me, and right now, I wanted no sound to come out of my computer. I shut it off and took it out to look at it. I saw the X and O's and the brand logo at the bottom of the CD cover. Dead nails in the heart. I couldn't figure out for the life of me what it was until that moment. Then I saw a note. You thought you were golden. You'll see how much you shine soon. I put the CD back in the case. There was only one person that I could see trying to taunt my friends and me if they were. Maybe it was that guy from the band after he heard what happened. I wanted to accept it was a joke and that it had been all, all along. Maybe this was just a bad dream. I told myself. I lay in my bed staring up at the ceiling until I was fast asleep. I woke to a phone call from an unknown number. Hello? Jude, something's wrong with Mackenzie. I recognized Casey's voice. How would you know if there was anything wrong with her? I asked, almost annoyed. She isn't answering her phone. Maybe she's with Matt. I already checked with him. Okay, well, maybe they're doing something private, if you know what I mean. I said, sitting up in my bed. I don't think it's that, because Mackenzie, when she got home, she called me in a panic. She had this weird envelope on her front doorstep. I had one, too. I got off my bed. Was it a CD, by chance? Yes, and it has some weird numbers on it. It looked like they were written in blood. It freaked us out. We were going to go to the cops, but 
then I figured we should all go together. Yeah, I got one too. Have you talked to Alex? Do you know if he got one too? No. Mackenzie was calling Matt to ask him, but that was hours ago, and I'm really worried. Okay, I'll come over. I'm calling Alex now. I picked up Alex on the way over, who was none too happy to share the CD he had unboxed with me. It was a song called Death by Rock and Roll by The Pretty Reckless. I bet it was that creep. I saw him at Kyle's wake. Came with his uncle or some shit. Do you know his name? They call him Spaz, but not sure about his real name. He's just using Kyle's death to get back at us because we pissed him off that night at the grotto. I drove on without saying anything. We got to Casey's house, but the first thing I noticed was that the lights were off when they should have been turned on. Alex looked at me, and I back at him. There was fear in him now. I got out of my car with Alex following, and we walked up the porch of Casey's house. I knocked lightly and then texted her to let her know that we were there. I knocked on the door again, but this time harder. I finally could take the suspense no more, and we just opened the door. It wasn't even locked, but there was nobody home. Thought she just called you, Alex whispered. His irritation was clear in his voice. I did. Come on. Maybe she's in a room. She was. Casey? Hey, we're here. Above her bed was a giant Lana Del Rey poster that Kyle had bought her at the show in Columbus a few years ago. Her bed had white teddy bears and flowers from Kyle's funeral strung about the bed. Facing away from us was Casey sitting at her desk. Her head was leaning back in her big gamer's chair. In front of Casey, her laptop was wide open. There was a song playing. All I could hear was... Writing blood on my walls and shit. A number was flashing on the computer screen. Two, 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 two. And the song playing was Heroin by Lana Del Rey. Casey's wide-eyed expression told me that she was no longer part of the living. Casey was staring at the ceiling above us with a flower crown on her head in the typical festival and Lana fashion and what appeared to be heroin needles sticking into her forehead like a crown of thorns. Casey, did you get a hold of... Alex stopped talking. Casey was dead. I looked back at the screen and the computer was shut off. Behind us, we could see a reflection of a man. I turned as my heart leapt out of my chest to see the man was gone. It was as though he was a phantom. There was one second there, and then he was gone the next. Alex and I were out of the house as fast as we could be, and I was on the phone with authorities. Police wasted no time in arriving, but now I was more concerned with where Matt and Mackenzie were tonight. We didn't stick around. We left before the cops even arrived. We took off down the road and sped toward Matt's house. When I got to Matt's house, I found him in his backyard laying in his pool with Mackenzie fast asleep on his chest. Guys! Alex screamed. Casey's, um... Mackenzie was already crying I, before I could get out the words. I'm next. Mackenzie started to cry uncontrollably. No, don't say that. We'll figure this out. I'm going to kill that bastard if he comes near Kenzie and me, Matt spouted. There has to be a way to get to him before he gets to us. Yeah, if we knew who he was, Mackenzie exclaimed desperately. Alex looked at them and then back at me. I'm going to kill that fucking guy tonight. What song did you get? I asked her. Pictures of you by The Cure? There is this number three flashing on the screen, too. I know that means I'm number three. First Kyle, then Casey, and now me? What is he going to do to me? Mackenzie was too emotional to speak. Alex broke the mood. What about you, Matt? Man in the box... Alice in Chains. Nice. At least none of us got Justin Bieber. <laughs> Our killer has good taste in music. Even Matt and I had to laugh out to cut out the mood. Unfortunately, I'm last, I said, looking at them. 
There was a call that came in on my cell phone just then. It was from an unknown number. When I answered it, it was a FaceTime call. The person on the other end of the call was someone whose back was facing away from us in a chair, bound and gagged. I looked at the others. Where is this? Whoever was holding the phone hand out so we could see the name of the printing building where my mom worked. My heart sunk. Don't touch my mom! I screamed angrily into the phone. I started towards the car. Don't! Wait up, Jude! Matt yelled. Three of them fearfully piled in my car and headed over to the printing company where my mom worked. When we got there, it was locked, but there was a back entrance that I knew my mom would go in sometimes if she were running late for work because the locks were not set to an alarm. We entered, and I could hear the sound of brown-eyed girl playing in the background. My mom had brown eyes, and all I could think was this bastard was cutting them out of her eye sockets or something. I ran in and grabbed the shovel from the warehouse to defend myself. There was no one around. I followed the hallways towards the break room, where it looked like he had been keeping the person tied up. When we got there, there was no one there anymore. Alex, Matt, and Mackenzie were all three behind me. However, when I turned around, only Alex and Matt were there. Where's Mackenzie? Matt freaked out and started screaming for Mackenzie. We did not find her right away. We went down the corridor to the room that printed signs. My heart was beating out of my chest before I could even get to the printing room. Alex and I saw her first. A man stood over her, taking pictures of her as he slid her head under the cutting and ceasing creasing machines used in the manufacturing advertisements. The light from the man's camera kept going off like a strobe light in the dark, causing my eyes to dim. I ran towards him with my shovel and hit him over the back of the head with it. The man fell to the ground. It appeared I had knocked him out for the time being, and a rush of relief went through me. Alex and Matt tried unsuccessfully to save Mackenzie from the powerful machine that had already done so much damage. Mackenzie was tangled inside the machine now, her once blonde hair, now the color of crimson from the blood. We were so busy trying to save Mackenzie that I looked over towards the machine where the man was seconds ago. He was now gone. The lights went completely out. I heard Alex scream, and the lights went back on. Matt and I stood looking at one another. No, I should be the next. Matt was screaming. We have to find Alex. We heard car wheels spinning out of control. I ran outside and could see a black van exiting the parking lot. We got inside my car, following behind as quickly as we could get my car to go. We followed the van through the streets and ran every single light. Luckily, there was no traffic on the road. We kept going when we got on the highway. We followed all the while Matt was crying and hitting the dashboard. This is my fault. I should have saved her. How did I take my eyes off of her, even for a second? I looked ahead with one goal in my mind, to destroy whoever this was. I saw the driver pulling over and exiting the highway. I continued to follow the van. The driver pulled down a dirt road and then stopped, turning the van off. Matt and I sat and looked at each other. We waited for the driver to exit. Instead, he remained inside the van. I could take it no longer. I just looked at Matt. Screw this, let's go. Wait, this could be a trap, man, Matt said to me, but I didn't hear it. I was on my way towards the van with vengeance. Then, as almost on cue, both van doors opened up. Our assailant was not acting alone. I saw someone rush at me and grab me, and then I felt something go inside my neck, and I passed out. When I awoke, I realized I was in a rundown house. I was tied to a dinner table and stripped down to my underwear. I looked around the room and realized I was alone. Where was Alex and Matt? It was just me, or so I thought. I heard a voice then. How'd you like my playlist? The room was empty except for the voice in the intercom. What? Where was this son of a bitch? I like this one very much. You made it so easy for us. 
Who is us? Where are my friends? I have the best for last. I heard the sound of a rock guitar spiraling, and I recognized it as a solo beginning performed by Slash on the song Anastasia. Beautiful, isn't it? I find killing people to music enhances my art, said the baritone voice. Who are you? I asked stupidly. Why, I'm the man from August Ridge. Unfortunately, I had to enlist some help. Don't worry. I always work alone. But you were already supposed to be alone. What did I do? You liked what you saw, didn't you? What? That girl was so beautiful, but so deeply tortured. Phoebe, the doll I created. Jude, you thought my art was clever, didn't you? You just had to touch her. No, you're fucking sick, man. Let me go! Floodgates began to open and tears fell from my face. I was sure I was going to die. Let me show you my instruments. A hole opened up in the ceiling and dropped Alex to the ground next to me. I tried to look at him, but I already knew he was dead. His body crumbled like a sack of potatoes in front of me. He had at least 70 broken CDs sticking out of his eyes, cheeks, chest, arms, and legs. Tears fell again, and I felt defeated. How was I ever going to get out of here? Then I saw a figure at the foot of the old dinner table I was lying at. When I got closer, I realized it was Spaz, the kid from that band. We're gonna fucking eat you now. Not so fast, Spaz, said the voice. Spaz was sitting at the table with a large meat saw and a savage look in his eyes. Then something unsuspected happened. I looked up. Looking at Spaz lean over as blood came from his mouth. Matt was holding an axe and was now untying me from the table. I shot up, and we nearly made it to the door before Alice and Chain's music started. A steel set of spikes hit from beneath our feet, cutting Matt almost in half. His life was taken in front of my eyes, literally seconds after he saved mine. All of my friends were dead now, except me. Then, I lost consciousness again. This time, I woke up in the hospital. An older distinguished man was sitting in front of me. He wore a black silk suit and had dark brown hair. He was a fine looking specimen by anyone who would take notice of him. He sat across from me eating something that looked like steak. What ha happened to me? I went to speak, but it hurt to move. I wouldn't do that if I were you. It sounded like that same voice. I couldn't breathe anymore. This was becoming a nightmare. I just could not escape. <laughs> I didn't kill you. But you may notice some bruising and some other changes, he said, smiling. I mean, I'm sure we'll meet again, he said, wiping his mouth and placing what looked like a cow tongue on my hospital table. I wrinkled my nose up at him. And then I sat up, still fuming, but unable to speak. Oh, and Jude, I left you a parting gift until we meet again. He smiled and walked out. I grabbed my hospital chart to see what the bastard had done to me. It was then I realized he had cut out half of my tongue. Even worse still, the fucking monster ate it. If I could have been sick, I would have been. A few days later, my mother took me home. 
She was struggling to get back to normal after everything that her son had gone through. They were still looking for the man who assaulted me. I tried to describe him by writing it all down, but they never found him. The following day, after I arrived home from the hospital, I received a box. When I opened it, there was a lot of wrapping inside. The first thing that caught my eyes was the photos of a homemade CD. My stomach churned. I opened it up, and inside was a CD with the title, A Playlist to Kill People To. The track list was as follows. Last Kiss, Pearl Jam. Heroin, Lana Del Rey. Pictures of You, The Cure. Man in the Box, Alice in Chains. Death by Rock and Roll, Pretty Reckless. Polly, Nirvana. And as I looked in, there was a bonus track. Shut Up by the black-eyed peas, and a smiley face next to that one I guess was his tongue-in-cheek, no pun intended way of saying he shut me up. There were pictures of all the deaths on the cover of the CD. At the bottom, he had signed it with multiple X's and O's, and also said, Love the man from August Ridge. That wasn't the only thing. Much to my added trauma, inside the box was something much more gruesome than all of that. Matt's head was in wax at the bottom of the large box with a bow around it. My friend went missing in a pop-up Halloween store. If you're a fan of Halloween and enjoy dressing up, then you're probably familiar with those pop-up Halloween stores that take over abandoned shopping malls or spots in strip malls for a few weeks each year, only to disappear again until the next year. I live in a small town, and while I'm sure we could have gone to local Walmart, However, my two friends and I wanted to try the new pop-up Halloween store, Mr. Fun Times Halloween Extravaganza. Everyone had been chatting about the new place in town and there were signs hung up all over the place. Come one, come all, to Mr. Fun Times Halloween Extravaganza. (laughs) It was one of those places that took a spot at the end of the town in the long abandoned mall that closed the following summer. The rumor was the city was going to tear it down and build a new parking lot for a nearby business. That hadn't happened yet. But what was temporarily in its place was the most amazing Halloween store I had ever seen. The place was huge and fit with a mini carnival outside with clowns, with makeup done, and it was done so well you could swear it was real. 
They smiled and waved as we walked in front of the store, and they were everywhere. They were made to look exactly like Mr. Funtime, the store's mascot, which was all green with black hair and fangs that when he grinned had little words written on them that said, Halloween. <laughs> it was weird, but for whatever reason, it seemed to work. People all over town flocked to the new store in droves. They sold food like hot dogs, nachos, and cheese. And when you entered the store, it was dark except for black lights. And all over were more of those green clowns that offered their assistance to help you find just the right costume. I was looking around the store when my best friend, Joe, gravitated directly towards these weird masks that were painted all white. On his way over, he knocked over a stand with glass makeup paints and they spilled all over the place. All the clowns in the store stopped what they were doing and looked directly at Joe. Joe smirked and rolled his eyes, not even attempting to pick it up. Dude, aren't you gonna tell someone you did that? I bent down trying to pick up the broken glass and finally a woman with pink hair and dead eyes came over with a mop. Oh, I'm really sorry. She said nothing to me. She just began to clean up the mess as though she were a zombie. I looked around the store and all the green clowns were now back trying to assist the many customers that lined the store. There was carnival music playing over the loudspeakers, and I tried to concentrate, but it seemed like it was getting louder by the second. Wow, these are weird, Joe said, picking up a white mask with no holes for breathing or eye holes cut out. It looked like one of those masks you would hang on the wall for a decoration, but you wouldn't wear. <laughs> those are boring. Don't tell me you're gonna buy one of those. I said, wiping the white makeup onto my jeans that seemed to stick to my fingers like slime. What was the stuff made of? I don't know. I just like masks. Joe looked at the mask with the look of a guy that was in love. I didn't understand it. But then, my other friend Eric looked over toward these giant snakes and decided he had to have one. I rolled my eyes and ignored them while I walked around the store alone. I was eyeing a pair of giant glasses that I thought looked kind of funny when someone tapped me on the shoulder. Break it, you pay for it, said the voice. I turned around and looked up at the face, greeting me. It was one of those giant green painted clown guys. Uh, I'm just looking. Well, is there something I can help you find? He grinned wide, and I noticed there was something almost unnatural about his mouth and I saw it had traces of blood dripping from it. I shrugged it off because it was Halloween after all, and I didn't want to seem scared. Uh, I'm okay for now. I just thought these giant glasses looked kind of funny. The clown looked at me and stopped grinning. He stared at me for a long while as I watched the unblinking look in his black eyes. Then suddenly he smiled wide again, with his pointed fangs jetting out like razors, and walked away from me and went to speak to someone else. I watched him unfazed as he walked up to a woman that was standing with a small child, and I saw her look at him and act completely normal as though he were just an average person in a costume. I couldn't shake the feeling that these actors were all really into their jobs, and I guess it made it okay since they were getting into the spirit of the whole season. I heard Joe then scream my name. Reggie! Reggie, come quick! I walked over to where he was standing and looked at him. He was holding that damn stupid mask on his face. Dude, seriously, get something scary. Uh, it won't come off. I looked at him and smirked. <laughs> what do you mean it won't come off? I looked over at Eric who was now standing next to me with a package of fake mustaches. I looked down at the bag and rolled my eyes. What's going on? Eric asked, looking at us both. It won't come off, guys. Come on, this isn't funny, man. I'm ready to go. I looked at them both and began to walk away. No, please help! Eric yelled. He was now making a scene. Parents and other customers were looking at him like he was just some crazy teenager on drugs. Can I be of assistance? Said one of the green clowns that were now standing in front of me. It won't come off. It won't come off! Eric yelled again. This time I could hear tears in his voice. I was suddenly very concerned, and the clown just looked down and grinned at Eric. Come with me. 
I think I may be able to assist you. Joe was still freaking out. I can't breathe! His voice was now growing muffled, and the clown grabbed him by the arm and pulled him toward the back of the store. I follow behind with Eric next to me. Where do you two think you're going? Uh, we were going to go with you to help our friend. Oh, don't worry. We'll take good care of him. He pointed to a sign that read, All customers are important to us here at Mr. Fun Times. He took Joe with him and shut the door behind. I heard it lock. And when I ran to open it, it wouldn't budge. What the hell? Eric asked. I don't know. I, I guess we just wait. We waited for what seemed hours, but it had only been about 30 minutes. We stood there as we watched all of the customers in the store shopping and check out. The zombie girl with the dead eyes and pink hair was ringing stuff up when she was doing it in such a cathartic state that it was apparent to me something was wrong. I looked around the entire store and I saw clowns walking people towards other doors, like the one we were standing by currently. I looked around and finally the door opened and Joe came out looking as dead as the girl with the pink hair. Eric and I were both relieved, but there was something wrong with his eyes. He looked like he was stoned or something. Hey man, are you okay? asked Eric. Let's go, he mumbled. Eric and I didn't waste any time getting out of that store because there was something off about the entire place. When I got home, I was in the mood to watch television and forget all about the events of the afternoon. The next day, I was at school, sitting at the lunch table with Eric and Joe, as Eric and I talked about sports, which was, you know, a usual thing for us. Basketball, baseball. Joe stared blankly at the table. As soon as the bell rang for our one o'clock period, he stood up mechanically and walked out of the cafeteria. Eric and I looked at each other, like, what's wrong with him? He walked down the hallway and out the front door of the school. Hey, uh, Joe, where are you going? He didn't answer. He just kept walking. Eric tried to stop him, but he just ignored us, and he kept going. We followed him all the way back to Mr. Fun Time's Halloween extravaganza. There was no way we were going back into this place. It creeped me out. Stop! If you break it, you pay for it, said Joe as he walked into the store, shutting the door behind him. I walked inside, but Joe was nowhere to be found. I looked around, and there were still the customers and the green clowns. Eric and I looked at each other, then ran through the store trying to find Joe. Joe! I yelled, but I couldn't seem to find him. I saw the same girl at the counter with the pink hair, and she just kept bringing items up with no expression on her face. Joe! Eric called out, and then one of the clowns stopped us. Hey there, better stop running through the store before you break something, or worse yet, you get hurt. Where's Joe, my, my friend from yesterday? The clown just stared blankly at us. I rushed past him as I saw Joe go through the same door from yesterday. The door shut behind him, and I once again found myself unable to open it. Let's go help, Eric said, and so we left out of the store. The two of us ran to find someone who could help us out. We went to the local police station, and when we got there, Eric and I ran straight up to the counter where there was an officer. Please, can you please help us? Something happened to our friend. The officer looked concerned and allowed us to explain our story. He seemed doubtful, and then told us to leave. There's no such place as Mr. Fun Time's extravaganza. I think you boys need to go home and stop trying to play pranks on police officers before you get into real trouble. Eric and I looked at each other. We walked out of the station, and then we both decided to go back ourselves and see if we were able to try to help find Joe. Before we did, however, we stopped at his parents' house to see if he'd maybe come back there. I'm sorry, boys, I think you have the wrong house, said Joe's mom as she shut the door. Eric and I were beginning to feel panicked. We were unsure as to what to do. It was like Joe never existed. The store never existed. And our story was growing colder by the second. 
We decided to go back to the store, but when we got back there, there was no sign or trace of the once fun-filled extravaganza had ever existed. We walked around the building and looked for a sign, any sign at all. We looked at the doors that were now boarded up with wood. The building that used to be our local mall looked exactly like it did before the pop-up shop moved in. We never did see Joe again after that. Then I keep an eye out for Mr. Fun Time's Halloween extravaganza in case it pops up somewhere else. Eric and I have each other, and we know what happened. The only thing that still bothers me is why didn't his mom even recall Joe's existence? That was last year. Just the other day, I had a ray of hope. I noticed the girl with the pink hair sitting on the sidewalk not far from where the store had been. She was smoking a cigarette, and she still had that same dead-eyed look on her face. I approached her and asked her about Joe. Sorry. I don't know what you're talking about because I never worked at any Halloween store. I think you must have the wrong person. No, I'm sure of it. I stopped mid-sentence as I could see a tattoo on her forearm of a green clown with large black eyes. The clown's mouth was wide open. And there was a tattoo of Joe as he was being swallowed whole by a big green clown with razor sharp teeth. I grabbed her arm to get a better look. Hey, you break it, you pay for it. Never open the door to strangers in the middle of the night. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Somewhere in the back of his mind, Jared Salisbury knew there was someone knocking. He had been dozing, and quickly he would be out like a light. Yet there were was this ever-growing, persistent noise. Was he dreaming? No, it was knocking coming from the front door downstairs from where he was sleeping. It was Halloween, and the kids in the neighborhood, all of them, it seemed, had come that evening. Gerald was now in bed, and the last of the candy had been devoured by the Smith boy next door, but had been around later than the other kids. Darcy Smith, his mom, was a nurse and worked till seven. She was quickly making her rounds with her 10-year-old son, Jake. Jake was a practical joker. <laughs> Could it be him up at this hour? Surely he was dreaming. This time he opened his eyes, feeling disoriented as he looked around the room. He was in his bed now and his wife lay snoring next to him. 15 a.m. read the clock on the nightstand next to his bed. Surely this was an emergency. Perhaps something was wrong. Maybe one of his neighbors was at the door with an emergency. 
Perhaps it was Darcy Smith. Was Jake sick or harmed? She was a single mother and reminded the Salberries of their own daughter that had lived out of state. They would cook for her every other night of the week. Jake would watch television with Mr. Salisbury while his wife cooked dinner. The Smith family were regulars, and it wasn't uncommon for Darcy to pick up Jake sometimes later in the evening around 11 after her shift at the hospital. He looked over at his wife, Beth. She was knocked out as though nothing was going on. He knew no one would be waking her up now, especially at this late hour. When Beth was out, she was out. A bomb could go off and would lay soundly asleep next to him, not even budging. He rose from his bed and went to the top of the stairs. He looked down the stairs where his front door was and saw nothing, and he heard nothing. Perhaps he was dreaming after all. There it was again. That persistent knocking that wouldn't let up. It was like when the telephone keeps ringing even though you've already picked up the receiver. Now he was very concerned. And as he stood at the bottom of his stairs, about to open the front door, he paused for just a moment to rub his eyes. Something in him made him take stock of the situation. He tried to remain as calm as he could, yet his body began to shake for no obvious reason, as though it knew what was on the other side of the door before his eyes even laid upon it and his mind could even comprehend it. Perhaps it was only his sugar. You know, at 74, you had to be careful of those things. Yet deep down, Gerald knew his shaking wasn't because of his sugar. He peeked through the curtains of the front door, and he couldn't see anyone. This puzzled him for a moment. There was a definite knocking only seconds before, but as he looked out the curtain of his front door, he could see nothing and no one. Was he losing his mind? He wondered. Maybe it was a kid, but what kid would be out this late? Barely morning, if even that. Probably teenagers' pranks on unsuspecting elderly. The annoying knock had agitated him now. It began again. And only once did the knocking happen before he opened up the door. He was angry now. But then he looked down, and that's when he saw her. There she was a child of no more than six or seven at his front door. The part of him that had once had young children, all grown up now living far away, worried as his heart tugged. What could be the matter? Why was this youngster out at this hour? Even with the fears that part of him, there was a father, a grandfather now, it tugged at him. Then he looked at her. Her hair was dark, and she wore what could have only been a white party dress, but it was in shreds, and it looked dirty. She carried a yellow basket, like something from another time and place. She kept her head down, not moving. Trick or treat, she said in a small voice. Feeling his body begin to shiver from the cold, his voice found itself in her presence. What? What are you doing out so late, little girl? His voice cracked as he shivered from the night air, hitting his cheeks and sneaking in through his pajamas. Trick or treat, she said, ignoring his question. My goodness, aren't you cold? He had noticed her dress had short sleeves. Trick or treat, give me something good to eat. This time he saw her smirk, but she never looked up, not even once. My dear, it's far too late for that. I mean, trick-or-treat ended hours ago. Do you have an adult with you? He asked, barely peeking his head out to search around. He had heard stories of robbers using children as decoys to get into their homes of the suspected victims. I'm not alone. We're all here. Trick or treat. Just then, he noticed her take a step up, just one of the two steps separating her and him. Gerald look, took a step back, feeling a strange fear taking hold of him. 
Who was the we? She was referring to. Gerald began to shake even more than he had originally, feeling the icy wind. Now, with more of a force, he could not hold back the chattering of his teeth. Just then he heard his wife yell to him, and it snapped him back to the present. Gerald! Gerald! Who are you talking to at this late hour? Come back to bed. I'll, I'll be up in a minute, honey. There's a little girl at the door. He could barely remove his eyes from her because of paranoia. He happened to tear his gaze from her just long enough to look upstairs to see if his wife was standing at the top of the stairs. She was not. She was still in bed mumbling to herself. A little what? A little what? She trailed off. She was falling back to sleep. Gerald had only looked away for a second, and when he looked back at his child, she was on the porch in front of him now, staring up at him with the blackest eyes he had ever seen. He felt numb and sick, like death was crawling into his veins. Trick or treat. Give me something good to eat. Gerald took a step back, falling onto the stairs. He looked up, and yet still the child, with her crooked, off-putting grin, smiled back at him, as though to convince him that she and everything was okay. The way you tell an animal that you're about to euthanize that it'll be okay if you just stroke its head at the last moments of his life. He stared at her. She cocked her head from side to side. And as she did... Two strange figures appeared behind her. They were shadowy, and Gerald could not make out what they were. He tried to focus on her and on them, but he could not. She stepped closer to him, still smiling her grin. Trick or treat. Give us something good to eat. She was closer now. Gerald wanting to kick her, run, froze in place, and no matter how hard he tried, he could not move. He tried to get up, but as though someone or something had placed a giant hand on top of him with a force so strong he couldn't budge, he began to feel as though he were suffocating. He was losing breath fast, and he knew he was dying. Why are you doing this? He managed to barely say the words, his breath now straining, and he felt as though he were losing consciousness. Because we're here to get our treats. Now that you have had your tricks, give us something good to eat. She trailed off and Gerald lost consciousness. That Halloween was the last time anyone had ever seen Gerald Salisbury. His wife had no idea what had happened to her husband of 55 years. She had gotten tired of waiting for him and she had fallen back to sleep that night. When she awoke the next day, the front door was wide open and Gerald was gone. There was no sign of him. The police were called and a search was done. Still, no one knew what had happened to him. He was never seen or heard from again. His wife had said he told her he was talking to someone, but she had no idea to whom. There were no other witnesses. Except when the cops questioned the neighbors, Dorothy Smith stated that she had nothing nor had she heard anything that Halloween night. Jake Smith had tried to tell his mom, but as usual, she didn't listen to him. He had been up that night and had not been to sleep, probably a mix of too much candy and scary movies, playing one marathon of monster flicks after another. Jake had heard knocking at the front door of Mr. Salisbury's house and he crawled out of bed to look out of the window. He had seen a bunch of shadowy figures with black eyes and sharp teeth dragging Mr. Salisbury into a black car speeding away. It happened so fast that he thought he was seeing things. That is, till the next day, Mr. Salisbury was nowhere to be found. There are other witnesses. Just the Halloween two years before that had seen some kids knocking in doors of people in the neighborhood. That Halloween, an older woman from three streets over had went missing. So, this Halloween, if you hear a knocking, 
Just be aware of whom or what is on the other side of that door. This happened in a town not far from yours. It happened in a neighborhood just like yours. Innocent and filled with kindness. It has happened and it is going to happen again. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed these three scary tales. Don't forget to like, comment, follow, all that good juicy YouTube stuff. On that note, I am wishing you all a very happy Halloween. Good night.